Welcome to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel, part of the Veritas Radio Network. This is Brother Andre Marie coming to you from St. Bernard Center in Richmond, New Hampshire. Our websites are Catholicism.org and Reconquest.net. My email address, should you care to send me a quick um, question or comment or suggestion, is bam at Catholicism.org. That's bam at Catholicism.org. You can also find me on social media. I am on Twitter at Brother underscore Andre and also uh, on Facebook. Just search for Brother Andre Marie and you will indeed find me. This evening's show is episode number 229 and we're calling it The Counter the Catholic Reformation, rather, the Catholic Reformation. And my guest is Mr. Ryan Grant, the founder and president of Mediatrix Press at, what is it, Ryan, mediatrixpress.com, is that it? That's correct, and I'm also on Twitter at Chester Bellock, uh, is it Chester Bellock 3? It's funny, you don't look up your own Twitter handle, so. Yeah. Yeah, Chester Bellock, at Chester Bellock 3, and also info at mediatrixpress.com. Okay. Oh, for all you old-fashioned types, do email. Okay. Um, I once heard a college student quoted as saying, uh, email, that's what I use for my grandmother, uh, because now they have all these other alternatives. <laughs> okay, so we we're talking about the Catholic Reformation. Now, um, so we're really going to talk about the Council of Trent, which kind of got the Catholic Reformation started. And um, just by way of sort of summary introductory comments on my part, which might make me sound like I know something, but Brian knows way more about the subject than I do. The importance of the Council of Trent is in its being two things at the same time. It's the heart and the soul of the Catholic Reformation, which is the authentic reform of the church uh, after the periods of abuse that led up to the uh, Protestant revolt. It's also, secondly, the definitive moment of the counter-reformation, namely the reaction against the Protestant heresies. By an almost universal agreement, the counter-attack of the church to the movement that is known as Protestant, the Protestant Reformation really began seriously with the Council of Trent. It was called by Pope Paul III, uh, and it was continued by Pope Julius III, and after 18 years and 25 sessions in all, Pope Pius IV concluded it and solemnly confirmed its decrees. Trent condemned the heresies of Luther, Calvin, and others of the so-called reformers. It issued decrees on the Eucharist, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, the sacraments, uh, including baptism and holy orders, and also the teachings on marriage, purgatory, indulgences, and the use of images. So that's just kind of a summary of what the Council of Trent uh, was. It's an enormous um, um, period of, of church history, and it is really the response to the, uh, of the church to the Protestant heresy. Now, um, now, Ryan, where would you like to begin, um, sort of laying, laying the foundations for the Council? More or less, and I think what we should probably do is lay the foundations uh, beginning with refuting a certain myth that is very, we heard quite a bit about it from quite a few prelates back at the Reformation commemoration a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, the church needed Luther to reform. And without Luther, why, you know, Luther was you know, obviously guided by the Holy Spirit to help reform the church. And how many Catholics have heard that in RCIA, in, uh, at, the, at the pulpit, perhaps, God forbid, but unfortunately so, from prelates, bishops, uh, the Pope, <laughs> et yeah, cetera. Yeah. And unfortunately, and this is kind of a, it's a, it's a, a complete black legend, historically speaking, and it's, it's kind of more has to do with secular pop history than it does with any actual history. And it ignores the fact that Catholic reformers had been working to reform the church since all the way back in the 15th century. We won't spend too much time there and you know, there are a couple of names like uh, Cardinal Jimenez de Cisneros, who's mm -hmm. the, the uh, cardinal primate of Spain, um, and he you know he sets up universities. He was a consummate humanist. He uh, published the first polyglot Bible, a really amazing Bible in uh, the Old Testament, it was in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin in, in columns. And they even had notes to reference the Syriac and other translations and, and textual variants and other notes that if you didn't know those languages, that it would make those useful for you. And then likewise, the New Testament, Greek and Latin in the uh, in the, the Peshitta, the Syriac version of the New Testament. So they had, you know, it's an incredible work of scholarship. And there were others just like him, you know, that, that were reforming the church. 
And St. John Fisher, I've talked about him in other talks. We won't mention too much about him today. But it was already before Luther, while well, Luther was still um, you know, teaching as a monk, doing not much else but fretting about his uh, his salvation and going to confession every five minutes. Fisher <laughs> was a bishop actively reforming his diocese and kind of laying the model which others would look to you know, even at the Council of Trent. Then you have uh, the, the general movement of humanism, and which is a wide movement, has a lot of people in it. A lot of Catholic reformers. Now, there's also humanism on the Protestant side too. When you think of people like Oculampadius and whatnot and Zwingli, but um, humanists in general look toward a reform of the church. They're looking for ancient, you know, Latin and Greek texts. The movement shifting away from the pagan Renaissance more toward the church fathers. And you have figures like Erasmus, who's you know, is a mixed bag. Erasmus, yeah, kind of an ambiguous, an ambiguous character yes. in a lot of ways. Exactly. Uh, you know, Lorenzo Valla, that Erasmus followed a number of subjects, a number of issues. The, um, but you also have their opponents that were critical of them that were also humanists, like Latimus at Louvain, and the debate about between Latimus and uh, Erasmus, for example, about which church father should be the, the principal church father read. The, um, you know, Erasmus kind of thought that Origen should be the church father above all church fathers, whereas Latimus argued instead that Augustine should be the church father read par excellence. And, she, and that's, of course, one of the things that contributes to the cult of St. Augustine, as it were, that, that ends up uh, in, in Louvain, and, or Louvain is how it's properly said, but a lot of people say it by a, the Anglicization of its French spelling, Louvain. But um, anyway, so... It, it's Dutch, right? It, it's a Dutch... Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> it is. Louvain. And... But in the major university there, and actually one of the big reforming universities too, reforming scholarship, refer, uh, looking to the church fathers again. Um, and so, you know, Latimus is a major figure. One of his successors would be Ruyard Tapper, who's another major reformer in the church, right? And so the uni so universities like Leuven are, are producing people, you know, Catholic thinkers that again are looking to the church fathers, that want to, re you know, reform some of the abuses. And what were the abuses? Everyone jumps toward indulgences, of course. Everyone knows all about those. But there were other things that were actually far worse. Uh, nepotism, pluralities, pluralities were whereby a priest would hold more than one benefice or a bishop more than one diocese, plus several benefices. And the way that uh, church income worked back then, you didn't get a salary per se for the things you did. Rather, you had what was a, a position would be held in commendam, and patrons pay the salary for you to carry out some sacred work. And what often happened is, of course, well, hey, if I could get more than one, I get more money. And people would sometimes work to get more than one benefice, perform maybe one of them, maybe. And yeah. then likewise with dioceses, they want, you know, bishops held various dioceses. And bishops at that time, for the, the most part throughout Europe, were creatures of their period. And they were rather mediocre for the most part, uh, you know, which actually seems to be the case in almost every period that wherever even where you find saintly bishops, they're kind of the exception that proves the rule that yeah, those bishops yeah. range from good, incompetent to mostly mediocre or to positively evil. Now, now you know? so, as a result of the multiple benefits uh, phenomenon or abuse, uh, whereby some cleric had, you know, he was abbey of this, he was abbot of this abbey, abbot of that abbey, pr prior of the other abbey, you know, maybe in three totally different parts of the same country. Um, and then he might be bishop of more than one diocese and he got all the incomes, so the benefices that came with that. As a result of that, he wouldn't uh, then be resident in his own diocese. So his own diocese was sort of under some kind of, uh, 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 you know, management by whomever, right? It wasn't the, bi the bishop wasn't functioning some kind as of the vicar. father. Right. It would be some kind of vicar who would basically be paid to do the job. And he's got to you know, scratch around for whatever money he can get to carry out the administration while the bishop lives on his income at the royal court or in Rome or in whatever, you know, major city that he's actually living in. And he's more statesman than he is bishop or shepherd. And they, they, they don't really pay much attention to the needs of their flock. It's why St. John Fisher is more or less the exception that proves the rule in this period, because he's actively on his horse, visiting every place in his diocese, preaching to the people, giving last rites in houses that uh, nobody would go into, that... Um, 
you know, and these are things that, that just aren't done. And oftentimes you would have where it might be a hundred years since a bishop had actually resided somewhere by the time mm-hmm. the reforms of Trent are being put in place so that you have Charles Borromeo. Yeah. He goes to Milan and, and he had a fight with Pius IV and eventually he his, succeeds when his uh, uncle, with St. Pius V. Right? Right, right, his uncle wouldn't let him go <laughs> take up residence, even though the whole point of Trent is to force Episcopal residence. So, but then, you know, he's already preparing the ground because he knows certainly he's going to be there soon because God is going to, has to let this happen. And then when St. Pius V comes to the throne, Borromeo is finally able to get him to reluctantly let him go. Because even St. Pius V did not want to let Borromeo go because he was such a competent administrator and a man of such good morals and saintliness. But uh, nevertheless, so finally he does go to Milan after 125 years of no bishop. Wow. St. Robert Bellarmine, when he became the Bishop of Capua, there had been no bishop there for about 80 years or so. And the whole diocese was in a really sorry mess, which in three years he transformed into a model diocese. So it shows you know, what, what happens when a saint takes up the Episcopal ranks. But nevertheless, anyway, so to not get too far afield, th- these were a lot of the abuses that people wanted to, you know, to correct. And then again, you have other things, clandestine marriages that'll show up in the later period of Trent. And then the, just the general doctrinal issue. So with Luther, uh, when Luther comes on the scene, right, you know, the average people are fairly uncatechized. They know what the sacraments are. They have a good grasp of the history of the Old Testament and the Gospels because they get that through preaching and art. And, you know, at least as good of a grasp, especially in the major Old Testament stories, as anyone would have had in any period except possibly the 19th century, when more and more people read, were literate in the Bible than I think any other period, probably. And so, the, but at doctrine, they didn't know. And, you know, there's a lot of confusion. You still had in England places where they had like Lollards that would run around teaching, you know, Lollard doctrines and whatnot that uh, on, on certain aspects of scripture, which really just amounted to anti clericalism largely, right? Yeah. So you, so you have these kind of problems. And then Luther comes on the scene. Now, Luther. This is kind of one of those hidden facts that it was actually discovered in 1935 because they found Luther's lecture notes when he was teaching scripture for the uh, the Augustinians. And, you know, and he's what does he do? He's already teaching faith alone already back in 1512. This is before everything happens with indulgences. This is before anything happens with any other subject. So. Um, so we don't need to recount so too much. F- five years before the right. the the sort of semi legendary nailing of the theses on Wittenberg Precisely. Cathedral, which um, and, there, and that's another story too. That uh, of course he didn't do that. Nobody, if you're looking for the nail heard around the world, you, you'd be looking in vain if you had a, <laughs> a time machine like in uh, Back to the Future going back to see when it happened. And you'd be sitting there and you'd be like, Hey, when when's the event going to happen? Then you'd see a clerk coming over from the university and with some paper and glue, pasting up in Latin the 95 Thesis on the door and walking away. And, and that would have been it. <laughs> That's all oh, you wow. would have seen. So it's more like it the, did... the paste heard around the world or right. the paste it's not heard. Less. <laughs> yeah, not heard is, is correct because nobody really noticed or cared. It was just, oh, another disputation. And the vast majority of the 95 Thesis was actually Catholic in its its teaching. Yeah. But he believed in, he happens... believed in purgatory. <laughs> Yeah, it does. And so it, all, it had certain errors in it, and then it had certain things that were positively wrong, but most of it was, was on point. And what happens is that some of Luther's students translated it into German and spread it around. And it was able to pick up some of the anti-clerical feeling based on this, this grave abuse of indulgences. But what it is for Luther, Luther is using the, the abuses in the church as kind of his shtick or his motif to push his heretical doctrines. And that's what it's coming on the next year with Cardinal Cajetan. He meets Cardinal Cajetan and, and confesses, at least at the time, his contemporary account is that Cajetan was very fatherly, the, the head of the Dominican order. He was very, uh, very, very mild with him and, and exhorted him to the faith of Christ. But only a year later, uh, then Luther is appealing to an ecumenical council, which is, of course, the classic delaying tactic of most heretics mm-hmm. and schismatics. It's like we're going to appeal against the judgment of the pope to the to the next council. It, and you, let me just do a reset here, Ryan. You're listening to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel, part of the Veritas Trigger Network. This is Brother Andre Marie coming to you uh, from St. Benedict Center, and I'm interviewing Mr. Ryan Grant on the subject of the Catholic Reformation. We're discussing what 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 led to the Council of Trent right now. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ryan. So the uh, Leo the Tenth 
um, has his theologians, including Cajetan, work on the condemnation of Luther's decree, since he was unwilling to submit to the church. So they write exerge domine, and condemning everything that Luther had, uh, you know, had taught mostly, except in a few points they missed, like faith alone, they didn't mention it there. So Luther takes that, uh, with all these articles that of his that were condemned, and he publicly burned them, and then he burned the entire corpus of canon law. And so the Reformation was on. And then at that point is basically when, you know, he begins calling the Pope the Antichrist and he's no longer in any respect a reformer. And now what he's actually doing is setting the course of reform back many years because, a lot, you know, anything that, you know, there's now there's a whole conflation and confusion of terms. A lot of people don't even know what Lutheranism really is. It just has something with opposing abuses. So a lot of humanists become under, understood as being of reformed opinion, quote unquote. And that embraces people who actually were Lutheran and people who weren't. And and that's one of the things that causes suspicion in the church hierarchy and causes the, the whole program for reform to slow a little bit. Okay, so what you're saying is there was a, there were actual authentic reformers who wanted to reform the church, but because reform talk got mixed up with the Lutheran heretical agenda, uh, it made for a kind of an ambiguity and it made for a lot of mistrust and suspicion. Precisely. And then it gets even worse, because now you have to factor in the political situation. So most of Europe is dominated by three monarchs at the time. So Henry VIII of England uh, is, is one of the more famous monarchs of the time, at least at this period, he, in the 1517s, 1520s. He's young, he's handsome, he's very Catholic, very, you know, a lot of his stamina, he's st- fairly wealthy for an English king, just just not nearly as wealthy as his competitors, mm-hmm. namely Francois I of France, the, the former Count of Angoulême, who becomes king after um, Louis XII dies. And then, in a, he, and then he becomes this big rival for Henry. He's about a couple inches taller than Henry, just as young, and richer. Uh-huh. And then you have Charles the, uh, the, the, right? the king of Spain, okay. uh, Charles I of Spain, And he was the grandson. Now, he's also the Lord of Burgundy, which borders France, and also the Lord of the Netherlands, which borders France on the other side, by the the English Channel. He's also now the King of Spain, because he's the grandson of Isabella and Ferdinand on his mother's side. And on his father's side, he's the grandson of the Holy Roman Emperor, Maximilian I. So as as King of Spain, he's now in control of this vast empire of the Netherlands and the Americas, along with Spain which had become a major military force under even before Ferdinand and Isabella, I might add, but especially under them. And then you get to the, the empire, right? So the, uh, Maximilian I dies, and Charles V uses New World gold and loans from the German banking houses of the Fuggers to get himself in position to become the next Holy Roman Empire, which he, Emperor, which he does. Now, you right? mentioned so, Charles I and you mentioned Charles V, but it has to be clarified right. that that's the same so man. So Charles I of Spain and Charles V of the Empire are the same dude, same yeah. guy. Yeah. <laughs> so he's, he's basically in control of most of Europe now. So, you know, so he and Francois of of France naturally are at odds with each other, and it it shortly after goes to blows in war. So it's Habsburg Habsburg versus Valois, right? Those are the two lines. Exactly. The the empire and Spain or Habsburg. With Henry VIII playing as a a sort of tiebreaker on either side. So both sides are courting Henry VIII. Henry has just finished a very expensive war with France that ultimately got him nothing. And he had negotiated a special peace, which was consummated at the Field of the Cloth of Gold, which was uh, in uh, Picardy where they, they'd set up all these tents, which were made of cloth of gold, and they even set up a jousting a ring of games, and so the English and the French celebrated their prowess of various sports. Henry and, and Francois actually get into a wrestling match, where which Francois wins with his <laughs> extra two inches of height, helped him win that. And uh, then the uh, they, they swear perpetual peace. It was so perpetual that uh, a week later, Henry meets with the young Charles V, and they negotiate a, a, a plan to attack France the next year. <laughs> <laughs> so these three monarchs are constantly stabbing each other in the back, which unsettles all of their dominions. And it makes things constantly in flux, territories moving back and forth. And we could talk a lot more about these guys. But what happens to Charles, of course, is that he has an uprising in Spain. In where the Spanish are not happy that their monarch is now living in Germany and using their money 
and the things that they've worked hard for in, in the tax money and everything to go out to pay for armies to fight the French. It's like, no, you fight the French from Spain with us. Don't do it over there and ask for us to send more troops over there. So the Cortes has a split and there is actually a revolt that starts. It's called the Common Era. Okay, and the, the, the Cortes has, the court has basically being the parliament. It's right? the parliament. Yeah. Right. So the, and so they, they, a bunch of nobles split from that and, and other interests in the country. And they, so they, they loosely are called the Comuneros, right? And so they come together and make uh, a revolt against Charles. And they use his mother, Juana, as a figurehead until they could get a new king. So Charles has the problem, of course, he can't get across the Pyrenees because the French control it. So he has to go to England to Henry VIII with hat in hand and promise to make Wolsey Pope and pay up all his, you know, all the loans from Ferdinand way back and plus make a whole bunch of new ones, basically promises the moon. And then later he fails to deliver, in which I, I've spoken of that in other places. So in the meantime, in Nevers, there is a, you know, the, the Basques there had recently been conquered by the Spanish, and they're none too happy about it. So they see the Comuneros revolt in Spain, and they say, hey, this is our chance. And so they you know, contact Francois I and say, hey, we would like to really kick the Spanish while they're down. Would you like to help? And, oh, I, I would never be so happy, the French king says. Mm -hmm. And so he sends a force in, and they make their strike at the stronghold of Spanish power in Nevera, which is called Pamplona. Uh, and, and then the Spanish garrison was very short. The French expected them to, to give up. And one of the Spanish captains refused. And so they kept the fight going, which the French were really impressed with. But then the Spanish captain gets shot in, uh, in one of his knees and then you know, falls. And then the morale drops with them. And then Pamplona falls also. Now, is and that the same siege of Pamplona when St. Ignatius Loyola got it's injured? It's the very one. That's okay. the very captain. Inigo. That's the very this captain. This time he okay. goes by Inigo. Inigo, which was a Basque and, name, which Ignatius right. was sort of a Latinization of a Basque name. He picks right? that up then when he's in Rome. Until he's in Rome, he actually goes by Inigo, but Inigo, but we can call him Ignatius henceforth for our purposes. And now you know the rest of the story. He goes back yeah. to Loyola and he gets uh, you know, told there's no courtly romance things for you to, to read and drink yourself to sleep <laughs> you with. Gotta so, read, you got to read the saints. Christ, the lives of the saints. Mm -hmm. and, the, gold, uh, the golden legend, right? He was reading the golden legend. Precisely, okay. uh, the Jacobus de Voran. And so then, uh, you know, so he reads this and, you know, and now you know the rest of that story. Mm -hmm. But it's one of the more important stories. It's born of a historical accident, ultimately. And, and now that, that was also 1517, was it not? That wasn't that the very... Uh, 20, 22. Oh, oops. Okay. A few years off. See, that's why I'm not a good historian. <laughs> that's right. You're, all, you're at the ballpark. Yeah, right. You're better than most people. So, But nevertheless, it's, uh, it is one of these things that eventually will come to the assistance of the church in, in the long, the next 10 years of the formation of the Jesuits. Then you have, but there's other religious orders too that lay the ground for Catholic reform, principally in Italy, but their model gets copied elsewhere. So the, the, the two most important ones would be the Theatines and the Capuchins. And so the Capuchins start around this time, and it's a reform of the Franciscans, a, a Father Matteo, oh, blast, I can't remember his last name, uh, he begins wearing, you know, going to contemplation and trying to live more, more like a heretical life. And he's, he's the, the love and dream of every Franciscan through the ages of restoring the primitive rule of St. Francis. So they so he starts wearing his cappuccio, his long pointed yeah. hood. Now the uh, Pope Nicholas V in the 15th century had actually reformed the Franciscan constitutions and shortened up their hood, right? And so when you read Capuchin literature, especially early literature from this period, they always make it a big deal about the hood because that's kind of their distinctive mark that they're using to show that they are carrying on the true spirit and the true reform of Saint Francis. Uh -huh. So so it's Matteo so, Matteo di Bassi. Yes, Devasi. And so he gets his, um, you know, it attracts several others to join him. At first, they get, you know, they, they have a lot of opposition, but eventually they, they're able to overcome that. And they only have one major hiccup in the way. One of their members, uh, Okino, uh -huh. he ends up becoming the superior general. And shortly after him, the superior general, he ends up uh, apostatizing. He goes, becoming he becomes a, a, uh, yeah. becomes a Calvinist and yes. goes over to Geneva. So that put a black mark on them for a while. But in general, the, 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 the morals and the reform life of the Capuchins was such that you couldn't deny it in that it, again, attracted a lot of people to their reform. So, but the bigger one, the more important one, far out of proportion to its actual numbers in size was the order of the Theatines. So the Theatines were started 
um, it, it, it's like a loose confederation, like like the Oratory of Saint Philip Neri. If you're familiar, with, if yes. listeners are familiar with how that's set up, so it was secular priests, bishops, and laymen too. So the Count uh, Gaetano, the Count of Tiene, was the first major member that draws everyone involved in it t- together. And you have other figures: Bonifacio de Calle, Giovanni Pietro Caraffa, who's later put Paul the Fourth, and uh, he was the Bishop of Chieti. And Chieti is uh, the Latin name for that city is Teate, T H E A T E, and that's how they get the name Theatine. Yes. Is actually because of Carafa's uh, bishopric, even though he does give it up so he can live with the Theatines. So they uh, are distinguished from other reform orders at the time that you see in Italy. Uh, you know, obviously the the Capuchins and also the Barnabites, the uh, the Somaschi and various other orders that are like working in the hospitals and trying to embrace poverty and in and, and reform life and, and morals. So they established the uh, the Oratory of Divine Love, yeah, right? and that's actually what they grow out of to become the Theatines. So what they focus on is prayer, meditation on scripture, also working with humanists, bringing humanists in to the love of God and to convert their talents away from looking at pagan Greek texts to looking at the church fathers now, and just, bringing the church fathers into print. Ryan, just so that people understand it, just a quick thumbnail, what is a humanist? Okay, so a humanist at this time, it differs very much from when somebody uses that term today. Yeah, that's why I the wanted hum- to ask. <laughs> yeah, the humanists appear in the 15th century and they were basically those who uh, um, look toward the, the great human sciences of Greece and Rome, not to the exclusion of God, but rather to the perfection of man by the recovery of the best achievements of man. And so and that's essentially where most of the humanists are, especially in the 15th century. So they're looking to pagan Greece and pagan Rome. They're looking to recover classical Latin, recover uh, classical Greek, which had uh, was, was very much um, lost in the West, and they, some people knew Greek, and more had been filtering in, like when uh, Constantinople fell. Greeks who came over and could effectively teach Greek were pretty much set for life. If they come to Italy, they had no want of pupils. And, and so do. Erasmus was kind of the the uh, one of the more famous of the humanists, right? He's one of the more famous for a number of reasons, and uh, some of that is is since the 19th century. He actually wasn't for a long time. He was very much looked down upon, like Bellarmine, uh, for example, or Victoria. They they um, you know give their you know their attack against him whenever they get the chance, even though he did die with the church, and not not without reason. Erasmus had embraced a number of positions that ultimately lead to things that the Luther and various Protestants would adopt. And then Erasmus is like, but that's not what I meant. But you know, yeah. even he couldn't ignore that a lot of his indiscretions had led to the formation of various things in Protestant thought, right? So, and again, humanism is a wide embracing movement. You have someone like Erasmus who says he doesn't believe the papacy is a divine institution. He, it's a human institution for him. And he thinks that we just got to roll away all scholasticism and get all the way to the purity of the gospels. And that's the debate with him and Laudamus at uh, Louvain, where Laudamus says, no, no, we, we do need the scholastics because there's problems that they worked on that the fathers, you know, hadn't had a chance to even study. And so many of the works of the scholastics actually give us a lot of fruit and understanding. And so we need a balance between recovering the fathers, you know, the first successors of the bishops, of the apostles that gave the faith to us and also in union with, so basically it would be the whole church. And that's really at, at large the movement that that held sway in humanism. St. John Fisher was also a humanist and very much uh, attached to the study of the ancient fathers when you read through his books. And a lot of he has a lot a lot of his citations are very correct, and that's largely because you know he was also very good friends with Erasmus, even though they didn't have complete agreement on a number of points. Thomas St. Thomas More was too, wasn't he? With Erasmus? Yes, he was. And although he was primarily a lawyer, he wanted to be a humanist. And he engaged in his own bit of text criticism and study and, and composition in Greek and other things. And he was very close friends with Erasmus and followed Erasmus in the opinion that the papacy was a human institution and not a divine. So in 1522, when Henry VIII wrote the Book of the Seven Sacraments, he and he had his preface, uh, you know, proclaiming the, uh, you know, the divine nature of the papacy. Moore actually asked Henry to leave that part out because Moore was largely the editor for for that book on the seven sacraments, and he asked Henry to leave it out. Wow! And Amazing. and Henry didn't, you know, didn't because Henry believed the papacy was divine, and Moore didn't. Amazing! Wow! And in what ten a... years, that will flip flop completely because in the process, you know, fit Moore will look to Fisher. And for, for various disputes with Luther, and he reads uh, Fisher's theological tracts against Luther, which are just full of 
endless citations of the Greek fathers, and it converts more to believing the papacy is divine in its institution. Now, he never doubted the authority of the papacy, but he just didn't feel it was a divine institution. And now he does, because he's been reading Fisher. Henry, on the other hand, is looking to his codpiece and his future <laughs> marital uh, you know, prospects. <laughs> and, it be- and eventually, Cramer is the one that, that settles it. Uh, it was an obscure Cambridge Don that was the chaplain to the Boleyn family. And so during the, the great travail of, of the, the king's great matter, as it were, uh, Cramer comes and says, well, you know, there we see kings in the Bible and we see bishops in the Bible. I don't see popes. Do you see popes in the Bible? I don't see popes in the Bible. Maybe there just isn't a pope. Mm-hmm. And therefore, he has no authority outside of Rome anyway. To, and Henry's like, uh-huh. And that solves the whole matter. Because then you could fix this whole marriage thing for me, couldn't you? Mm-hmm. And, oh, I would be so obliged, my lord. You know, mm-hmm. there, there's this, the Simpsons uh, satirized it rather irreverently, uh, where they have uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the reverend in the, the normal course of the series is playing Cramer. And he says, by the power invested in me, by you, I hereby <laughs> declare you to Henry and <laughs> I guess the Simpsons are good for something. <laughs> so they are, unfortunately. <laughs> or they used to be before uh, the Monsanto of media, Disney bought it up. But, oh, okay. <laughs> um, anyway, well, uh, somewhat in, in a few areas, but anyway. Please. Hmm. I get Ireland. <laughs> and by the power vested in me, by you just now, I pronounce you king and trophy queen. In the. So, so that's the kind of you know situations that. You know that we see in this period. So the humanists, by and large, are moving toward the the focus on Greek texts. And there's one event that really galvanizes the move for Catholic reform more than any other, and that's the 1527 sack of Rome, which more or less puts to death the the spirit of the pagan Renaissance in Rome. So what happened there is that the French and the Empire, the Habsburgs and the Vola, they're they're fighting over. The Milan, mostly. So Pope Clement VII, who actually wasn't too bad of a pope, he was somewhat capable, he was interested in reform, but found the political network just too complicated and decided to just kind of let the status quo go. Well, he ends up siding with uh, the French over Milan. And then the, the French, you know, suffer a horrible defeat. And Charles V, you know, because don't forget the papacy is still a political uh, state as well as it is uh, the head of the church sure. and religion. There's still the papal so, states. As well. Still the papal states, and so the the pope had supported actively the French in their claim against for Milan. Charles V beat them, and then he sends uh, his mercenary army down to uh, to Rome to teach the pope a lesson. And then the payment for the army goes into arrears, and there's debate about whether this was intentional or not. Um, but nevertheless, what happened is their payment goes into arrears, and they so they decide to just attack and take the city, which they do. And then they sack it for a month, and it was brutal and horrible. Uh, it, it left uh, for for uh, the next uh, fifty years. The the hatred of the Germans was bigger than the hatred of the Spanish, <laughs> mm. and uh, because of the horrible things that were done in Rome, uh, especially the horrible de- uh, de- um you know, sins against women in the city. And we'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, and nuns and, and so many horrible things that were done there um, for the whole space of a whole month. And so Charles V had his complete, you know, control of the Pope for some time this way. So it's a, they never forgot that. So not, neither both Clement VII and even uh, the next Pope, Pope Paul III, who at this time was Cardinal Ferranese, who was locked up with the Pope in the Castel Sant'Angelo as the, the Germans are destroying the city, many of whom were actually Lutheran, uh, mercenaries in Charles's armies, and so they actually break into the papal apartments, and they go uh, they go over to because you know where the the Raphael rooms are in the Vatican yes, Museum. Yes, yes. So he, he has to escape through those of Athens. tunnels, right? He got he has to escape yes. through those tunnels, and a, a bunch of Swiss guard died trying to make they sure did. he got to Castel Sant'Angelo. So, so what the, the the Lutherans do actually is they go over now facing the famous School of Athens on the other side is the Disputation of the Eucharist, which actually I think is even greater than the School of Athens, yeah, and doesn't really get the appreciation in art history. And so one of the uh, German soldiers, the Lutheran soldiers, comes by and writes Luther's name right underneath it mm. <laughs> in in the uh, the fresco underneath the fresco. But um, so it was a really a terrible time, but what it, it committed the forces for reform, which were already kind of mounting in the Curia, shut out by the, the old guard, which was very happy to have all its goodies and its money and its income from so many different places. And 
now, you know, the, the reforming group has kind of the moral high ground. See, all of this happened because you loved money and you loved, you know, your position in not Christ church. And there, there was really no arguing with it. And so the reform party gets stronger. Clement the Seventh suggested, you know, the guy you've got to get is Farinese, because Farinese had, uh, he was originally appointed during the period of the Borgia of Alexander the Sixth and also uh, Julius the Second, two very bad Renaissance popes altogether, and later he converts to being a very serious reformer of the church right around the time of the Lateran Council, and then he gets fired up for reform of the church. So Farinese, he was a cardinal. He was, and of course, he'd had children. Uh, which was not unusual for lay cardinals at that time, even though technically they were considered in orders and not supposed to. And so he uh, <clears throat> gets ordained. And from then on, you know, he was chased from then on. He gets ordained and uh, eventually is uh, made, made a bishop and then pope. So now he's Pope Paul III. And the city is still in ruins for the most part. Um, <clears throat> But the, 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 again, the, the movement of groups like the Theatines and now, the, you know, later the Jesuits will come and other groups that will inspire reform and change in the city. And so Paul III gets to work. And one of the first things he does is appointing the men that will be kind of his point men for reform. Right. So, the, so um, you know, his cardinals, the few good men of Paul III, his cardinals, that would be the reformers. And so he appoints the first thing he does is appoint St. John Fisher as a cardinal. Now, there are two reasons for that. One was he was hoping very much, because he was in, in the tower at the time, and he was hoping very much that Henry would not kill a cardinal of the church, which, mm. of course, uh, it, was, it was not the case. Henry famously says, well, let the Pope send his hat when he will. He'll have to wear it on his shoulders, however. Oh. Right. And so, which is, uh, at least it was shortly thereafter that uh, the trial and execution of Fisher takes place. Um, another one was uh, Ghiberti. Ghiberti is a very uh, famous reforming bishop, and is one of the things they do is they, they go in to make visitations. They throw the priests that have concubines into jail, replace them with more capable and, and better men, or send them to the galleys or whatever. They uh, begin making sure priests that have pluralities. They start stripping them of, the, of their pluralities. They start prosecuting for simony. All these things that are on the books, but just not enforced, right? Mm -hmm. And so and Ghiberti was very minded, establishing convents of good reputation and so many other things. And you have uh, then later Jean Pietro Carafa, we already met, mentioned him, and Carafa is part of the Theatines, uh, is, is made a cardinal. I mean, ob obdurate and immovable, resolute, reforming spirit in Carafa. And at the same time, a uh, later enemy, and we'll, we'll see that, I guess, in a future program, but Reginald Pohl. Now, Pohl was actually Henry VIII's cousin, and he had fled England and refused to come back. And so he, he had um, was made a cardinal by uh, Pope Paul III, also, you know, committed to the series of reform. Giovanni Morone, who was a humanist, is, is now made a cardinal. Right. And so, again, in Marcello Trevini, one of the more important ones is actually St. Robert Bellarmine's uncle, or he will be because St. Robert Bellarmine hadn't been born yet. Mm -hmm. And also a very strong reforming spirit. And lastly, Gasparo Cantarini, who's another reforming cardinal. So all of these guys and you could add a few other names like uh, Jacobo Sotaletto and in a few other cardinals that were. Uh, very powerful reform cardinals. And so they begin kind of making a survey of how to reform the church. And the big question that was on everybody's lips, an ecumenical council. If it, it's not enough to go in this program, in this program, it was felt pretty much in every, you know, every country, you needed an ecumenical council. But how to do it? And see, Clement VII really was very much opposed to a council. He didn't want to get involved because he saw the, the hopelessness of the situation. The, the empire and the French and the English are fighting each other at every turn. We need peace in order to get the bishops here to have a council, right? And so he, he didn't even want to entertain it because the, 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 the hurdle to get peace was too much. Paul III, it's only 18 months after his election, and he finally makes the bull of convocation for Trent. Uh, although it wasn't actually originally cited to be held in Trent. It was going to be originally in Mantua and then Vicenza. And it was later negotiation that brings it to Trent, uh, which is a city at that time was in the emperor's, uh, in, in the, the territory of the Holy Roman Empire, but it's just close enough to papal territory so that it would be a good compromise. So what uh, the Pope does, and a lot of the time in between, is trying to get away opposition, remove the opposition of the cardinals. So, so many have been, you know, become bishops, theologians, cardinals, et cetera, members of the Curia that they were originally part of the Theatine movement. Mm 
that the movement for reform is just irresistible at this point. It, it can't be put down anymore by the old guard. And they're very much in the majority. The only exception with Paul III is in general, he's a reforming pope, and he truly was the man of the hour in terms of reforming the church. But he's still addicted to the Renaissance nepotism. He's still addicted. He makes his grandson's cardinals who were completely worthless. He makes... Um, you know, a couple of people that national interest uh, demanded that were also completely worthless, like like uh, um, Antonio Bembo makes him a cardinal, right? And he had no business being a cardinal. So uh, you had those little hiccups, but ultimately, really, you get the – they become, you know, you know, a, tr a true force for reform in the church. They write up this memorial saying all the problems in the church. And so they go over so many different things that are ails and ailments, and they, so they say clearly in this memorial, the root of all this trouble is that some of your predecessors looked about them for guides, not to what they ought to do, but to what they wanted to do. Guides who had proved to be lawful whatever popes found it convenient to do. Hence came the atmosphere of adulation, the all but impossibility of truth ever reaching the ears of the ruler. And also that very speedily learned men appeared teaching the doctrine that it was not possible for the Pope to commit simony. For the owner, they said, has the right to sell what is his. And also that the Pope, uh, what the Pope wants, whatever it may be, is the rule by which all his actions should be guided. Hmm, that's funny. That's wow, that sounds, you know, amazingly <laughs> contemporary, doesn't it? Right? It does. <laughs> and so they... Um, so they continue, it is from this as from the Trojan horse, Holy Father, that have come forth all those evils that have driven the church almost to despair of recovery. Evils, the reports of which amongst the, among the infidels have caused such mockery and blasphemy in the very name of Christ. Through our fault, we repeat, Holy Father, our fault. <clears throat> and so they, so they add on, you know, laying on various points for reform you know, addressing pluralities, and also reform of the Curia. And this was always the big problem. So you have the apostolic datary, and that, which functioned largely as treasury and secretary of state, but they also gave um, exemptions, you know, so the, the things that were given to use, right? So from any kind of ecclesiastical penalty, and as long as the price was right, as long as you could pay sufficient amounts. Mm. And the Curia largely subsided. And this is one of the things that has to be understood in how things develop out of the Middle Ages. If you had an office of some sort, you had no salary. So you made the money as you did the work by, you know, taking this fee and that fee and sometimes extorting things. So even when you go back to the 15th century, under Pope Pius II, and actually several popes, um, with the exception of Innocent VIII, they all have uh, Rodrigo Borgia as their Secretary of State and, and, and the Treasury. And why? So the late, the future Alexander VI, it's because he was an extremely competent administrator. He was very good at getting the papal work done. And, you know, so what did he do? Well, he, his office was not paid for. So he always had like an insane amount of benefices and pluralities under him to provide the income for him to carry out his office. You see, and that's how the, these things, much like in the fashion of, sec, of secular government, all these church offices were set up. So that's just one ex instance. And the curia largely runs the same way. So getting rid of pluralities, squashing these horrible practices in the apostolic datary, which all of the cardinals, Paul and Kafara and uh, – <clears throat> Contarini, et cetera, were so keen on, uh, the Curia complained, well, well, that'll be the end of the Curia. We won't have any money. We won't be able to actually, you know, do anything, which might have been just as well, actually. But uh, mm. nevertheless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, kind of like today, if you shrunk the government, things would be a lot right. better. Oh, exactly. Uh, Ryan, I need to do a reset. You're listening to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel, part of the Veritas Radio Network. This is Brother Andre Marie, and I am interviewing uh, Mr. Ryan Grant, the founder and president of Mediatrix Press, mediatrixpress.com. Come uh, on the Council of Trent and the Catholic Reformation. So, all right. So you're 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 talking about some of the abuses being addressed, leading to the Council, and you left off with uh, the memorial of the card of the cardinals to Pope Paul the Third, addressing the evils in the Church and how these need to be fixed. So these were reform-minded so, cardinals, mostly who came out of the Theatine movement, right? Right. A good number of them, or associated with them, or the Oratory of Divine Love. And what they so they all they all basically identify is that the the church a uh, spiritual society had been transformed into a venal administration. The popes, like all rulers, you know, listen up to flatterers and, and people give them adulation, and so they let whatever could be done happen. It's been noted by various historians, uh, Pastor and others, that 
the it didn't really matter who you appointed a bishop as long as the pope got the anates tax which was the first year of the income of that diocese sent to the pope and this also involved a good amount of usury which was tolerated because it, because you didn't just travel with gold in your wagon going down to italy especially going through the, through the papal states on your way to rome because the banditti would get you at almost every stage so you would transfer that money to this banking house which would have a branch in rome and they would send a message down advance this much credit to the Pope or put this against X amount that he actually owes us or something of this sort. And other banking houses had contracts with each other to extend and recognize the credit of the other, depending on what the relationship was. And so that's how all this money moved around. And it was uh, in a really horrible, venal situation. And the uh, and then, of course, non-residents in a diocese. And this is also noted by the, the, the memorial of Pope Paul III's cardinals. Again, again, the financial corruption, this is, of course, a tiny right. thing, too. Exactly. So you have all of these problems. So now it's, uh, you know, Paul III is you know convinced we have to get a council going. We need to make this work. But how? Because, again, uh, you know, Henry VIII at this point is out of the church. He's been excommunicated, but he still doesn't want to have a council because he's afraid a council could line up all Catholic nations against him. So, he, and, and of course, the French also don't want a council because they don't want uh, – because that, that Gallican strain is still present and it will be for a couple centuries more. They don't want to see the pope meddle. In, in, in the French response to Calvinism, and the, plus the Huguenots were starting to get a good deal of power, so they're afraid a council is going to upset their interior uh, administration and affairs at Trent. Or, sorry, Trent. Sorry, if if the council happens. So just so just so just a real quick summary. So so there there are three huge th- things raging right now in France: Gallicanism being sort of a a a, 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 a theological nationalism, the rights of the French Church, uh, right. you know, uh, uh, are superior to the any claims of the papacy in France, and, and an aping. So it's a, it's a it's like an uh, a leftover conciliarism, even though that's been condemned. There's some people that are still very much attached to the idea, and uh, so Jansenism, of course, which was. Which raged for something like the better part of 300 years, right, in France? That comes, I mean, that comes later. Okay, that's Jansenism later. Jansenism comes later. That's so the later. founder of, giant, of Jansenism is usually considered to be Bias or okay. Michael Dubé. M- Michel Dubé. Okay, and then yeah. – um, so, um, okay, pardon me. And that's so, later in the century. And the, but the Huguenots, the Huguenots, right. those are the French Calvinists, right? Right. And so they come around um, – we don't want to, have to really have the time to get, but Calvin makes an attempt to disrupt things in Paris by the, the affair of the placards, where the, all these blasphemies against the Blessed Sacrament and the saints and Our Lady are placed around the city. And it so incenses the masses, rather than makes them, which Calvin thought would happen, would make them see the, the silliness of popery, so he thought. So the people react and demand action, and so Francois has to put to death several people. Uh, they were noted Calvinists, and then you know they were suspected of being a part of it, and then you know Calvinism becomes illegal. But then it continues, and then the next king, Henri the Second, is again has the same problem with Calvinists, and they end up uh, acquiring a good deal of power and even a number of cities in in, in various places in France. So this is a you know a big and, problem. They they would rather not see a council agitate this problem. And a huge chunk of the aristocracy were Huguenots, right? Uh, not yet. Um, not yet. Okay, that's a later development. France, they're kind of spratted around it. But then in Germany, it's a different story. In Germany, you have a number of electors that go to Protestantism because the price was right. What oh. German princes knew or cared about religion is questionable, other than they knew they had to go to mass and they, they you know, <clears throat> keep good order, tie the church, whatnot. But uh, ultimately, when it came down to it, it's like, wait a minute. So if I become a Lutheran, I can reorganize this religious situation. The monks would just go out of the monasteries and get married, and I'll go take that monastery and make it my property. Ooh, yeah. I, I kind of like this whole it's thing. Such a deal. So a lot of a lot of electors become uh, Lutheran at this point. Actually, one one of the amazing things that's uh, happened is that with the city of Cologne, uh, the elector in Cologne, was very close to becoming a Lutheran. Now, but all he cared about is, uh, and he was the bishop too, but. <laughs> His only interest in religion was hunt, it was minimal, just to how quickly he could get mass done so he can go out and hunt. Oh. And that's basically the uh, the Bishop of Cologne's thought. Now, so, now j- just, so, just so the audience knows, we have a, like five minutes, Ryan, but uh, an elector is somebody who is a, a civil official, but his pr- principal duty was that he he was one of those who elected the bishop because he's not— He's a, a prince— 
You know, he, he elected the Holy Roman Emperor. That's what I meant. So, I'm sorry, yeah. I said that. I meant the Holy Roman Emperor. Some of them which, were bishops, which was elected. which was not a which was not a hereditary office. So they were elected. Right. It, it could be made hereditary if they chose, but in but in principle, it usually be whoever had the most uh, political clout and whatnot. So. Mm. Anyway, so so Saint Peter Canisius, uh, as a, a, a first is is converted to uh, I shouldn't say be converted, but he's first uh, drawn to the Jesuits by the preaching of Saint Peter Favor, and he says, "Wow, you know this this is what God is preparing me for and calling me to." So as a young Jesuit, formed you know basically from afar by Favor, and then later Ignatius with letters. He ends up establishing the first Jesuit house in Cologne, and he runs the whole uh, system of pamphleting and preaching that gets the the clergy of the city on board with preventing the the Bishop of Cologne from wow. going over and becoming a Lutheran. And that and that allows Charles V to recover the situation militarily to make his strike against the Lutherans, which more than anything else will keep the Bishop of Cologne in line and not not going over to the Lutherans. Yeah. So, so fearing um, fearing for his life probably was um, probably yeah. at that point. Okay. So now Charles V, on the other hand, was not terribly far off from Henry VIII and his conceptions of the church, actually, in terms of the authority and the role of the princes, especially the historical role of the Holy Roman Emperor as being one of the major figures defending Christendom. And, you know, so he looked at his position as having a certain degree of authority. So he thought he could settle the religious question in, in, you know, in Germany himself without the need for a council, even though he'd asked Clement VII for a council. Now he was rethinking it. And he said, you know what, let's try, to, let's try the synodal path. <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah, right. Exactly. But, but essentially, that's what he did. So he wanted to have a meeting with uh, between Catholics and Lutherans, and it try to work out a like a, a joint declaration of belief. Now he was, and we uh, solved okay. the religious question. Now we have about three minutes. So, but, but so he was very pragmatic, right? So he thought, oh, we'll just you know meet and 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 we'll 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 fix this right away, and everything will be peaceful. Right. And so he sets up what's called the Radisbone Colloquy. So theologians from the German side, which include Melanchthon and, and others, they, they come together and they try to establish various positions. And so the Catholic side has has uh, propositions. So Cardinal Contarini, we've mentioned previously, he was sent up by the Pope to, to at least have a papal presence at the thing. And some of what they drafted for the Catholic side was actually heretical. And in some of them have rejected the other theologian, John Eck, and, and, and tried to formulate a brand new theory on justification called double justification, which is funny because this is actually what Calvinism will end up adopting. But this is something that the Catholic side had, had come up with to, as a potential way to solve the problem of justification. Are you saying that Eck himself proposed that? No, not Eck. Yeah, oh. they, they, the, the other fellows on this uh, – um, in the colloquy okay. that were – um, you know, at the service of the emperor, now, they had come up with Eck was a Eck, Eck Eck was a Dominican, right? Right. So he was present for this. He didn't have any part of the double justification thing because oh, okay. he had argued right. against it. But and it, that's what they admitted. But then it became absolutely clear. Well, how can we solve this problem when the the Lutherans have been teaching for twenty years that the Pope is the Antichrist? How can they have any part with Antichrist? <laughs> and how can they have any part of a council where it sit equally when they hold the other side to be Antichrist? You know, because the language has just gone too far afield. So that fails, and Charles V finally gives into the Pope with the with the uh, proviso that the council will be held in German lands. And so this is in fifteen thirty eight. And so finally they settle on Trent which is a city in the mountains of Tyrol. It's close enough to papal territory that the Pope can keep an eye on it, but it can still operate freely and be in German territory. So Charles V doesn't feel slighted. So uh, they, they, he makes the convocation, but it takes until 1542 when they finally assemble for that first session. Okay, so at this point... There's really no place uh, that we can get started. To, uh, you've gotten us right to the eve of the co of the council, right? Right. Um, actually, I misspoke. I said 1542 is, the, uh, is when um, people start making their way, but the first session wasn't finally opened formally until 1545. Three, three years later. Okay. Yeah. So, and then, um, uh, and then, you know, we know just to look ahead a little bit, we know that they're going to be. Uh, struggles with uh, which bishops are going to show up. Some some monarchs aren't cooperative, and uh, and that's going to really complicate. And some are things. meddling even at the council. 
Uh huh. So uh, yeah, amazing. Um, I, I, Ryan, I, 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 we're about to run out of time, but I, uh, I wanted to point out that the actual authentic reformers who were on the ground doing work, pushing for reform way before the council started. Uh, that's something that should be one of the takeaways from this program, that it's not that there was no reform before the Council of Trent, but this was sort of the the um, the, the, the synthesis of authentic reformers uh, who were leading up to it. Precisely, yeah. that's right. Well, R Ryan, thanks a lot. I really appreciate your time. We're going to continue this at some point, um, and I'll get together with you to figure out when we're going to do that. You've been listening to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel, part of the Girls' House Radio Network. God bless, and we keep you.